Get in the know. Non-stop Vikings talk. It's Purple Daily on Score North and scorenorth.com. Welcome into Purple Access. Today it is Judd, it is Declan as always, and Tyler Fornis, our friends from Vikings Wire, which is also the home of my written work now, talking about, we are today, the Vikings 53-man roster. And Tyler, uh, Kevin Fielder, our our colleague at Vikings Wire, has a projected 53-man roster that you can find at the site right now. It's one of, in one of the featured spots. And I want to talk to you about this, because to me, there's not... There might not be a ton of positions open, but there's a lot of interest in the positions that are going to be decided on. We obviously started OTAs Mm -hmm. on Monday. There's going to be nine of those, a two-day mandatory minicamp. It's going to be held in early June. And then, of course, the Vikings are off till training camp. But I think that there's a lot of positions that the coaching staff is going to start to examine right now. So let's start you off with this one. What did you think, who did you think as – you went through Kevin's uh, work, and I'm sure you've got some thoughts as well. Who do you think might be some surprise guys on the chopping block who have certainly been on the roster for, I don't know, the last couple of years or so? So uh, I did this exercise a week before Kevin did, and I, th- I think it's good to get different perspectives on this. And I know you and I have talked about you potentially doing one of these as well. One that. guy I think is on the chopping block is DJ Wanham. And I, I find him an interesting case because he is an average pass rusher. And are you going to get that much more from DJ Wanham than you would from a Luigi Villain in year two, considering what the cost difference is going to be? Wanham's cap hit is nearly $3 million. If you cut him, it's just under $2.8 million in savings. Are you going to get that much more production from him versus Villain, especially with Patrick Jones II ready to elevate to that pass rusher three role? I think he's a guy that could be intriguing on the chopping block. Kenny Wongwu is somebody I've been talking about for a while, even before they pass that kickoff rule, which it's the same in college football. If you fair catch it between the zero and the 25, it goes to the 25 yard line as a touchback. Right. Kick returns dropped nearly 10% the first year of that implementation. And with the NFL, I'm curious to see how that is impacted. Um, their hope is to be able to limit concussions and try to uh, soften injuries. They really should have just gone to the XFL role where they're like they line up five yards in front of each other and nobody moves so the ball's caught. But it's the NFL and they just kind of beat to their own drum. Like I think those are two guys that um should be on the chopping block. Another one, Cam Bynum. Uh Ooh. yeah, he's an interesting one. He's not really a cornerback. He's had some struggles at safety. Is he going to fit in with Brian, what Brian Flores wants to do on defense? Yes, he has the versatility. But do you want to keep him over, say, a Josh Metellus, who's a dynamo on special teams? He's another guy I think could end up being cut because that safety room is pretty deep. Um, there's there's some real intrigue here, and I think the most intriguing unit is defensive line. Who the heck knows who's staying and who's going on from that unit? Tyler, do you feel that the Kevin O'Connell, Quasi Adolfo Mensa era, they did this last year where they cut a bunch of the picks in the, what, 2021 draft from mm-hmm. day two, do you feel like they're starting to kind of wash their hands from the Zimmer era and some of those fringe players uh, that they were drafting that they just kind of want to start basically clean slate with the own players they've basically now have drafted over the last two drafts? Yeah, and I think you're seeing Quasi Fomensa finding his guys and prioritizing those players. Last year, Nick Muse didn't make the 53. He ended up getting elevated to the 53 by the end of the season. And all, all 10 players from that draft class are still on the roster, including Luigi Villain, who was the one UDFA that ended up making the team. I would not be surprised if they prioritize some of their own guys versus those, excuse me, like you said, those fringe players, which is why the multiple players that I've mentioned as potential cuts are former Rick's, Rick Spielman draft picks. Mm-hmm. They also could save some cap dollars especially in Wanham's case. And I think that's something you really need to consider with all this. And like Metellus, if you cut him, it's um, $1.1 million in savings. And then the guy that replaces him on the 53-man roster likely makes seven fifty dollars to eight hundred and forty dollars So you're saving quite a bit of money there too. I think it's, I don't necessarily think that's going to be the only reason, Declan. I do think that Kwesi prioritizing his guys is a trend that we're going to continue to see. So it was day two um, that, that 
we had access, Tyler, Tuesday, OTAs. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you right now, what I observed, and there were guys not there. So just to be clear, it's voluntary. Lots of guys don't go. Or they, they come in for a day and then leave, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you right now what I saw defensively. And th this is going to go it, it, obviously long way towards Flores deciding on what he wants from a personnel standpoint. I saw chaos being implemented. The, this defense is going to rely on speed. It's going to rely on fast play itself. Like this is going to be the exact opposite of the Donna shell year. There is not going to be a predictability here. There is not going to be uh deferring to older players because I guess I should. Jordan Hicks was not there on Tuesday, but I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not going to be shocked if he gets cut because this thing is going to revolve around really um, a swarming to the ball and providing looks that basically drive opponents crazy. Now, what's interesting is, obviously, and this guy was not there again on Tuesday, and it's not a big deal, Harrison Smith. Harrison Smith's mm -hmm. role, you, you can see what it's going to be, though. He's going to be used much more like Zim used him in his prime years, which is just a, yeah. just a, an agent of chaos. Like, he's on the line of scrimmage one play, and then he's blitzing, and then he's not blitzing, he's dropping back into coverage. But anyway, long story short, what I saw, too, that might – cause you to reevaluate re the safety room just a little bit. I think we're going to see a lot of three safeties. I I saw that on Tuesday. I saw a lot of Metellus on the field with Seen. I think Seen was more in the Harry role, but Metellus seen Bynum at times. Mm -hmm. um, and these guys are being used, at least one of them, as hybrid linebackers. So at the end of the day, I'm going to be very intrigued to see, one, if Hicks makes the team, and two, if he does, how much he's going to play. Because if Asamoa can reach the level of play that they want because of his speed, I would not be I would not be surprised at all to see three safety packages with Asamoa as the lone linebacker out there. Yeah, so I'm going to push back a little bit on the Jordan Hicks thing. I don't think they cut him. A trade, I think, is possible. But after Hicks and Asamoah, it's a really ugly linebacker room with a lot of uh, meh and uh, like three UDFAs. Plus, with the contract restructure, $3.5 million of Hicks' salary, it's all guaranteed, like his entire salary. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the give and take they did. I don't think they cut him, but it wouldn't shock me if they didn't use him nearly as much. Um, and I do like that three safety idea. I think that's something that we've kind of talked about all off season. It's about versatility. It's about being able to attack. And if the defensive line can hold their own and be put in better positions to succeed in that area. And I think putting Tonga at nose tackle and Harrison Phillips uh, more on the outside three technique kind of spot, I think is going to help that defensive line significantly. And with Osimo's ability to shoot gaps, that's going to be a problem right. for offenses. Right. And then you get those three safety looks, especially like in nickel situations, like, um, you get like a like a four one six look where you've got four defensive linemen, pass rushers, one linebacker, and then play the football three sounder, safety, three corners. Four that, one six, baby. Yes, that's that's the kind of stuff that you want to see from Flores, and he's going to be creative. Like I just wrote a piece that's going to go up on Vikings Wire. By the time you're listening to this, you'll be able to read it. Six like uh, high recent high draft picks need to step up. One of them is Lewis Seen. I think they're going to use him like a versatile weapon. Think of what Javon Holland has become in Miami. That's what Lewis Seen is likely going to become here. Just a guy who can play in the slot. He can be a blitzer. He can play in the box. He can play over the top. Whatever you want or need him to do, he's going to be able to do. And it wouldn't shock me if his role changes on a game-by-game -game basis because of that. Tyler, is there any positions? You, I know you mentioned defensive line, um, and obviously cuts can now take place mm -hmm. uh, or cuts could take place during training camp. Other, obviously, other teams in the NFL are doing the mm -hmm. same thing. Is there a position group that you wouldn't be surprised that you could see the Vikings adding, the, you know, externally from? Like, let's say it's defensive line or whatnot. Is there a position group you're kind of looking at that you wouldn't be surprised if maybe like a last minute trade goes down at the end of camp or a, a, a surprise mm -hmm. add, I guess? Is there a position group that could, you know, help out that defense basically as you get more knowledge and we get more time spent in training camp? I'm going to go with two on defense. And I'm going to give you a wild card on offense. So linebacker, obviously, we just talked about that position. I think cornerback, and why I say cornerback, there's talent in the room, but outside of Byron Murphy Jr., and to a point, he's unproven as well. They're massively unproven. They need to show something. 
Now, Makai Blackman, obviously, just got drafted. If you want to add Jay Ward um, as a slot defender, he's going to be more of a versatile safety role. He just got drafted. And then uh, Andrew Booth Jr. and Caleb Evans both got drafted last year. They're coming off seasons with massive injury concerns. So if they don't step up in any way, I could see a guy like Marcus Peters um, or uh, somebody else where they either acquire him via free agency or, in the, or via trade. Because if that cornerback room doesn't show something like they think they're going to, I think adjustments are going to be made. And the real wild card here is wide receiver. You have your top three guys set uh, with Justin Jefferson, KJ Osborne, and Jordan Addison. After that, it's it's a crapshoot. Like, you think Jalen Naylor is going to be wide receiver four. He flashed a little bit, but he also flashed in situations where it he wasn't playing top defenders. It was in garbage time. And then week 18. So you really don't know 100% what you have in him. The coaching staff is high on him. And we know that McCardell pounded the table for him in the last draft. But what is he going to be moving forward? He was a sixth round pick. So expectations aren't super high from that perspective. Jalen Rager has shown that he can't be trusted to play offense after that disaster in the Colts game when there were some like injuries, like Justin Jefferson had to come off the field the two interceptions that he blatantly caused due to running the wrong route or stopping running his route. And then there's just a bunch of question marks after that. So I think wide receiver is a wild card here. Do, do you think that Rager makes the team? I don't think he gets cut because it's a $2.5 million dead cap. And I think he either gets traded for literally pennies on the dollar or they keep him around in some way, shape or form. He has value on special teams and he can catch punts. Yeah. Except um, in the playoffs when he tends to muff those punts. Yeah. I don't want to have Jalen Rager on this football team. I just, it's hard for me to envision uh, Kwesi Dofomensa cutting him for nothing and eating all that dead cap. I think they would try yeah. to find a home for him. Maybe there's another uh, general manager who's thinking the same way Kwesi did last year. We can get something out of this guy if we coach him up because obviously he was a first round pick. And teams like to take multiple chances on uh, first round pick reclamation projects. He can't run routes though, so I'm I'm done there. Like when when you can't run a route, that's the fundamental thing. Um, and I've just seen we have seen this before, right? Treadwell, mm -hmm. uh, Patterson, who who was a marvelous athlete, but he couldn't run a route. And so, if you can't run a route, if you're stopping on routes, or you, you're you know, and again in this league, man, it I'm not talking about the route was okay. If the route is not precise, the quarterback yeah. is screwed. Um, I think, Tyler, if we were to come up with a list, and it, this might might be fun at some point, of like the five most important things it, for the 2023 Vikings, from big stuff <laughs> to just stuff where, where you don't think about it too much, but it mm -hmm. remains incredibly important. I think one of those things was something that you broached. It is this, the production of Lewis Seen. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a first round pick. He lost again. I will go back to this with what I consider to be, um, you know, a coaching staff. I mean, Ed was not good, but a coaching staff that certainly O'Connell had some in input. Cam Bynum beat out scene in mini camp last year. Like by the time we got to training camp, he was not a, he was not with the ones ever. Like that's not a competition. That competition was done. And I think it's so incredibly important because to what you said about Scene's ability, abilities, and what he can do, if Lewis Scene is not seeing extensive playing time in 2023, something has gone incredibly wrong. Assuming his health is fine now and he looks fine, I think that's one of the most important things for this team defensively. If this defense is going to uptick, is Scene's availability and ability to do what you talked about, which is a mm -hmm. bunch of different things. Well, Jed, I think you found the topic for your next article. I think that's that's a, <laughs> You're that's always a thinking really about good point. Vikings wire, I love that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and and I think it's just in general, because we're so new, we're only 17 months into the Quasi Dofo Mensa and Kevin O'Connell era. And I think when you're judging this regime, we're really going to have to start judging it based on year three because they had to do so many different things because the Rick Spielman era and Mike Zimmer, they kept trying to keep – they they kept believing they were this close to getting to uh, having a Super Bowl run. And they gave out some contracts that reflected that. You saw it with Harrison Smith. You saw it with Dalvin Cook. 
And because they gave out some of those contracts, it strapped the beginning of this regime. And they're trying to undo some of those things. Obviously, they're eating the contract of Adam Thielen. Eric Kendricks is gone. Dalvin Cook is likely gone once June 1st passes. And I want to see how they continue to construct their vision. And I've been trying to get a sense of what his his ideal prospects are because Arif Hassan of Pro Football Network had it dialed in with Rick Spielman on what he wanted, how he wanted to draft, which traits he was looking for per position. We don't really know that with Quasi. We thought we knew that with 10-yard split. It hasn't held true with this class like it did with the previous one. So just getting a feel for those little things, I think it is one of those themes, understanding the vision. Because the vision, it, we thought it might have been clear. It's still murky, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It just means we need to keep gathering data and understand what they really want to do. Tyler, is there um, any players that are kind of in the similar Jalen Rager vein? Where maybe, and actually, is, is Odie chewing on your microphone underneath there, uh, Tyler Fornis? Um, yeah, he's uh, he's got a bone. I'll try and move it away from my desk because it's actually connected to my desk right now. Because he's oh, there Odie. you go, Odie. I got him want to some move. takes. Stella's good, mad. Man. Stella's mad in the background here. Odie's <laughs> chewing on bones there, but yeah, I, I could hear some clunking. The, uh, the the trained microphone ear and dog bony. I can hear both those things, Tyler, from a mile away. So no no biggie there, dude. And good boy, Odie. Um, yes. Is there a player from maybe the 2021 or maybe even 2022 class, Tyler? I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot here. That was a day one, day two pick from another team that might be, you know, in danger of not making a roster or maybe a trade gets facilitated. Mm. Can you think of maybe, and again, put you on the spot here, so it might be tough. Is there another Jalen Rager type player that you could see Quasi maybe buying on midsummer or towards the end of training camp, just like they did with Rager? Uh, about a little less than a year ago you know Declan that's a really good question and I'm going to stall here for a second and kind of I'm pulling up um pro football reference and looking at kind of what the NFL draft looked like um in 2021 like one of the tough parts about that question specifically is there were a lot of players that hit in that 2021 class in, in just in the top 10 there are all hits except Zach Wilson and Trey Lance. But Lance is still a question mark because of injuries. Like you're talking Trevor Lawrence, Kyle Pitts, Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddell, Panay Sewell, J.C. Horn, Patrick Sertan, Devonta Smith. That's your top 10. And then Justin Fields, Micah Parsons, Rashawn Slater, Elijah Vera Tucker. Like you're, that's a, you're looking Good at class. a potential historic draft class. Um, there is talk that Greg Newsom wanted out of Cleveland. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. But like – Elijah Moore, the 34th overall pick, already got traded to the Cleveland Browns this offseason. But kind of look at it. There's not a lot of guys who you think, okay, it's been an absolute bust. Um, the only one I could I could really see is a um, guy that goes by the name of Boss Man Fat, Kelvin Joseph. He was the 44th overall pick by the Dallas Cowboys in the 2021 class. He's more of a, a traditional cover three corner, but I do think that he can play some man. And I think as a reclamation project, you give like a like you give a six round pick you hit him in a seventh back and you kind of see what happens and you see if you can uh, get those tools and utilize them because like that buy low mentality I think is something Quasi Dofamess is going to continue to try. Yep. It's not always going to work, but sometimes situation means more than actual talent, especially with quarterbacks. It's why I'm higher on Jaron Hall being with the Vikings than I probably would be on any other roster. Because he's already played in this offense, and he already understands how to utilize some of those concepts. So I, I do think that buy low strategy could work. The tough part is, like, you want to buy from 2021 because you're getting at least two years. You're not just getting one. So you're getting two years at a value instead of just one, and then I have to pay the guy. But I think Calvin Joseph, he's already rumored to maybe be cut into in Dallas. I think he could be one, especially with how this cornerback room currently is constructed. So I think what's going to be incredibly interesting to watch, somewhat instructive, is, is this. As we get into training camp cuts, especially on the defensive side of the mm -hmm. ball, what Brian Flores guys, and I'm not even talking guys that played for him a ton, but may, maybe a practice squad guy from Pittsburgh, you know, perhaps a Dolphins guy. What Brian mm -hmm. Flores uh, coached guys start to get cut 
and I'm not saying it's going to be a name where we're all like, oh yeah, that guy was great or blah. But you know, he, I'm sure he's got a list and I'm sure that, that with his background, he's done some extensive work. That's where I think that you could begin to see like a cornerback brought in, right? Like mm -hmm. a linebacker brought in. And again, it doesn't have to be a household name, but it would be someone who, who could step in, know his system and be a guy that Flores uh, thought was trending in the right direction, but perhaps the Steelers or Dolphins didn't see it. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, Judd, because you want, like, obviously we saw with some of these defensive draft picks, Mikai Blackman, Jay Ward, those feel like Brian Flores selections. Uh, Jaquel and Roy, I'm not 100% sold that that was like a Flores directive as I am with the cornerbacks. So that that idea makes a lot of sense and bring in some of those players. Joan Williams never played directly for Flores, but he comes from the same system. Obviously, he knows Bill Belichick really well, having worked for him for over a decade. And you kind of combine those things. Yeah, I th I could absolutely see some of that happening. Who those players will be, no no clue. Um, well, I agree like that, we, yeah. we talked about it a lot this offseason. Eric Rowe, he played for him. Six out of his eight years, he's played for Brian Flores, which is pretty remarkable. Like He got traded to the Patriots from the Eagles after one year, and then he followed Flores to Miami. And now he's in Carolina. I'm a little surprised that Flores didn't try to bring him in here. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think with the, what the safety room was looking like, he didn't want to necessarily uh, create that much of a log jam, but that's a name. If Caroline ends up cutting him, cause I think it's a vet minimum deal. That's a name that I could see end up ending up here, but it's going to be fascinating to watch, especially because cut down day it's one day. Now you cut down all 37 players on one single day. They just want to make my life hell. It's crazy. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be absolutely yeah. crazy. And executives, are going to go nuts. And I actually think that you will see less guys now signed because teams at that point are so focused on their own guys that they're mm -hmm. going to be trying to keep their own guys potentially for practice squad and things. So it's going to be, it's definitely going to, to have an impact because I, I know that, that one of the old tricks was this, the day after you cut down to 53, a lot of teams would then make another move and cut a guy that they wanted to keep because the wire was so flooded that they basically tried to sneak them through. So this is going to be extremely interesting to watch. Um, question for you on the cornerbacks as well. So from your scouting eye, when you see or know what Flores wants, does Booth or Evans or both qualify as good, good fits? Because to your point, there's no question the guys they drafted back there are mm -hmm. going to be fits. Now, that doesn't mean success, but it does mean that they're fits for what Flores identified. Yeah. Booth and Evans, how close are they, or does one have a distinct advantage in your mind as being fits for what Brian Flores does? I think they're both fits. I thought Andrew Booth Jr. was a tremendous man cover corner coming out of Clemson. He had experience in zone as every college corner does, but I thought he was great at staying in phase, being able to attack the football when it gets there and not letting receivers really manipulate him. And I, I thought Evans was a better fit in a man scheme, but he's also tall and he's got relatively long arms. So you could see him being good in a zone as well. Uh, I, I do think that they both fit what Brian Flores wants to do. And I think that's important because fit means more than pure talent when it comes to the cornerback position because of what you're asked to do. Like Trey Hodges, Tomlinson, 5'7", 175. You don't want him playing in a Seattle cover three. He's not going to be able to uh, do as much. But if you want him just playing in man coverage in the slot, I think he can be a successful player. And I think that some of those elements are, as Odie gets a squeaker toy now, He's, um, he's just breaking things down with his yeah, dad, okay? That's yeah, cut him some slack. Back. He's breaking. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, you know what? He's staying in phase with this little zombie, and to that's me, what that's you got to really do. Important. <laughs> yeah, he, he attacks it re relentlessly. But I think getting guys who fit means more than just pure talent. Unless you're talking about a Jalen Ramsey, a Darrell Revis, somebody who's just that damn good at corner. Fit means more than pure talent. Absolutely, Declan. Uh, last thing for me, Tyler, uh, I saw Brandon McManus ends up signing with the Jaguars uh, this morning. He was released from the Broncos. Um, mm -hmm. I think you, uh, Thor, uh, myself, and, and you, we talked about the uh, rookie kicker they brought in, Jack P uh, Polensny from Georgia. Uh, was it a mistake to not maybe bring in Brandon McManus? Are you still good with the kind of internal kicking options that they have right now? What was your kind of take on 
Brandon McManus, a former Super Bowl winning kicker, uh, being on the open market. I thought it was odd. Um, I can't remember who's going to be replacing him, but that here's the thing with kickers. It's it's weird. Kickers can fall off a cliff really quickly. We saw that with Blair Walsh. And they're a dime a dozen if you don't have a Justin Tucker, a Steven Goskowski, and Adam Vinatieri. Like they're all just kind of there. And with Greg Joseph having been guaranteed $1.75 million this year, I really don't think there's much of a chance they let him go unless they have a chance to get Justin Tucker. Uh, so I, I think they're kind of in that, like, they're just set. They're going to be content with Greg Joseph being an average kicker and hope that they can uh, do enough in the margins to be able to make them successful. I also think, too, that eventually that they should go – and will go young. My whole thing with Zimmer or with Rick drafting like Carlson was, why are you giving Mike who hates kickers? Like he despises them and he's going to ruin a young kicker. Obviously Kevin O'Connell is the polar opposite of Mike. So I, I think that eventually when Joseph is replaced, Tyler, mm -hmm. and I, I think the dog agrees with me, Odie. Um, I think eventually when he's replaced, he's going to re be replaced by a young kicker because Kevin O'Connell will actually be patient. And, and I think the smart move here is, I mean, the Daniel Carlson pick was a stupid pick because of the head coach. Carlson's leg would have been, and he's proven it would have been great as a draft pick. Unfortunately, the, the system was wrong or the atmosphere around the team was wrong at the time. So I do think that Joseph eventually gets replaced by probably like a fifth or sixth round pick. And I don't think O'Connell will then mind bleep that kid. Oh, you're, you're, right. you're muted, Tyler. Odie was chewing on the zombie. So I had it's to make okay. sure we are, You know what? We are a dog friendly show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Stella was hey. barking too. So oh, no problem. Good old Stella. Um, And I think that is a really good point you made, Judd. The mental game. Um, there's so much about kicking that's mental. And I, I think one of the best people to talk about is Pat McAfee because um, he was a punter in the NFL and he was a damn good one, made an all pro yeah. team, pro bowls, won a Super Bowl. But the big thing with McAfee is he was a kicker uh, as well at West Virginia. He did both. And like just the, some of the nuances with kicking and how mental it is. And it, it can be really tough. Especially like it's like a baseball hitter. It doesn't matter how hard you hit the ball or how well you hit it. If it's an out, it, it's an out. And yep. you can be doing everything right and nothing goes your way. Kicking it is not too dissimilar from that. And because it's not too dissimilar, like you have to be mentally strong and need the support from uh, your teammates and the coaching staff. Like if something goes wrong, like, Remember that street uh, stretch Mason Crosby had a few years back where he was just an atrocious kicker, missed like four kicks in a game, had That's like Detroit. a string of yeah, multiple bad weeks. Yep. Like they stuck with him and they stuck behind him. And he made it till age 40 as the Packers kicker mm -hmm. after being a third round pick out of Colorado. Like you need to be able to have the back of your players, especially ones where the mental aspect of the game is so incredibly important. Absolutely. Check out his stuff, vikingswire.com. Heck, check out my stuff there, too. It is your one-stop shopping for Vikings news, information, um, projections on rosters. If you are a Vikings fan, of course, watch PD, but for written content, vikingswire.com is the place to go. Tyler Fornis, thank you, and we will uh, talk to you in a couple weeks. Skull Vikings, baby.